So I propose we start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our first breakfast session of uh, this year on a topic that we know we, from our experience that quite a number of organizations are looking at. It's modern application foundation architectures. We've did a lineup of a couple of speakers that want to share some insights with you, starting with uh, Bernard and John from BMP Paribas. We're going to talk about, uh, in particular, the why and the what of their journey into this space. Then we'll continue with Frederick, that will take us one level deeper and have us look an under the hood, architectural hood of what that such an architecture entails. And then with Peter, uh, we'll take a step back and look from a broader perspective at uh, why we're actually doing this sort of exercises and what we want to achieve with it. Now, before we start, some practical details. First of all, please stay muted during the webinar. What doesn't mean that we're not interested in your questions and remarks, so don't hesitate to interact and ask questions via the chat. We've seen in previous sessions that uh, there are some sometimes some lively discussions, conversations that take place into the chat that give us uh, quite some insights in what sort of questions you're asking yourself. If you have additional questions, don't hesitate to call us to contact us on your known uh, contact addresses or the email address that is there. And then it's, uh, it's nothing left for me than giving the word to the next speaker or the first speaker, uh, Bernard and John, the floor is yours. OK, thank you, Bart, for uh, this uh, nice introduction uh, and a good morning to, to everyone. Um, so I'm Bernard, I'm the head of uh, Transversal Channel Capabilities. And today, with uh, together with John, uh, we will go through the, the story of uh, BNP Paribas Fortis. John is the head of uh, enterprise architecture and also uh, responsible for the IT strategy. So let's uh, have a look at it. And on this slide, uh, you can see that we, as a bank, we want to help uh, with the dreams of our customers. Uh, so it's uh, it's we are in a changing world. So our customers they have a lot of expectations. Um, so this also means yeah that we need to offer our services through different touch points uh, through through the life of customers that uh, they have different touch points we have positioned them on um, let's say this uh, this axis uh, so you see that that uh, digital versus face to face local versus remote and if you look at this it's clear that we need to be prepared with our application landscape in order to uh, face to all these challenges and to meet the expectations of our customers. So this gives a nice overview of the global touch points and accessibility of the services. If we then look at the next slide where I take back a number of uh, needs of our customers, so you can see on the upper layer of the slide that advice is very important for our customers. They want to get advice in a situation in, that fits for them, something that is really their needs, what they need to have uh, in their time in their journey. They want to have SL free, uh, of course, applications that are 24, seven, seven days a week available online. Uh, that's, that's for sure. Of course, self-servicing is very important. They want to be able to also change their cell their, for example, card limits or or services that we can offer that they want to manage and configure it by themselves. And of course, fast time to market is a key element uh, as an expectation from our customers is they want to have changes. They want to have new technologies built in in the landscape of our uh, touch point with the customers. I've put it also uh, smooth payments because, as you know, with the, the boost and the yeah, explosion of online uh, web shops and, 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 and online sales, we are also playing an, a crucial role as a bank in the payments and in that journey together with uh, the customers. And well, that's uh, obvious, uh, we need to be as a bank, it's secure. Security is very important to access the different touch points. They expect that we offer, uh, of course, secure applications uh, by design. And last but not least, they also expect 
that we offer sustainable products, but also that we are, as a bank, also ourselves sustainable in the way that we deliver, in the way that we work in, in the environment uh, of, of uh, today. Looking at all those needs, we translated this into a number of IT pillars that we use in our uh, IT strategy. The first two ones are open banking and APIs, so I'll come back to that uh, later in the presentation. The second two are frameworks and DevOps, so these are also very crucial in our complete journey within the transformation of the IT landscapes. Certainly, if you know that yeah, as a bank, we are there already for a long time. We have a lot of different um, yeah, versions of the frameworks. We need to consolidate and standardize a number of things. And DevOps is, of course, one of the key enablers in our agile way of working that you want to apply to get also back to that faster time to market, as explained earlier. Data is crucial. Uh, John will come back on this one. Security asset, it should be there uh, by design. And we are using more and more the cloud um, services in order to make applications that are future proofed, that are able to scale whenever our customers need applications, that the cloud techniques are there to help us in a number of these needs for the, the customers for the customers. Sorry. And then the last um, icon is the Agile Impulse uh, icon, the, the name of our internal organization. The, the way that we organize uh, is since some time in Agile, full Agile, with the combination between business and IT. And I propose that we move on to the next slide and that John takes over uh, around this topic of Agile Impulse within our organization. Yes, uh, thank you, Bernard. Indeed, uh, like Bernard explained, uh, in 2020, we did the next step in our uh, agile transformation, where in fact we integrated the business teams into the agile IT teams we already had uh, at that time. And that is crucially important because um, doing application modernization is, uh, is not an IT thing, it's not an IT party. It's important to have business stakeholders involved on that, not only for awareness, uh, so that when having to make prioritization choices, um, modernization uh, is, uh, is on the table as well, but also for them to um, rethink and review existing processes, existing customer journeys, um, review your product and uh, service offering. Uh, that is also part of, um, of application modernization. And that is why it is important to have on a, on a regular basis agile ceremonies, including daily stand-ups, for example, where you have a product owner, an architect and a developer together discussing on what's next, eh? what are we going to do and how are we going to handle um, uh, those things. But even so, furthermore, eh, through guilds and community of practices, very often uh, some kind of challenge that a squad faces you're not the only one or you're not the first one to be uh, confronted with that. And so it's important to share practices, good or not so good, with the other teams so that you do not have to reinvent the wheel uh, uh, every time. And we'll have a concrete example of that later on in the presentation on, uh, on what that meant for us. So that's one uh, important aspect. And then on the right side on the slide related to our different work levels and the governance related to it because we have a, a strong architecture audience here today, so I'll try to relate to that uh, as well. Um, we had to adapt uh, because the, the, the speed and frequency at which you need to be able to make choices and confirm and validate options uh, on how to do things is, uh, is increasingly important. And so at different levels, uh, what we call initiatives, uh, it's what we used to call programs back in the day and opuses, what you would typically call a project before. On a weekly basis today, we have a governance cycle. Eh? And so, for example, every Monday afternoon, we have an IT validation committee where initiatives uh, can come for strategic orientation. Eh? And that committee is chaired by our CIO. Uh, that's every Monday. And on average, we have one to two topics per week each week uh, to, uh, to take position on, on topics there. And every Tuesday, 
we have uh, we have its alternative at opus level where uh, where on project choices every week in week out we we do the same but at the lower level and that's where i am the chair of that committee and on average i would say we have about 10 opuses each week coming there to validate uh, uh, choices so that is uh, an important step uh, we did to uh, to be able uh, to improve on that and then on the next slide bernard uh, coming back to the importance of um, data, well, I think it's clear to say that the, the awareness and the importance of data has increased over the past years, uh, and it's here to stay uh, for sure. Uh, but when you take into account uh, applications that have been designed uh, 10 or more years ago, um, that same awareness did not exist back then. And it's crucially important to be in control of your data, whether it is in your operational systems or on your data platforms, whether it is classical BI or newer data hub technologies, uh, all the same. Uh, thinking back of when the first time you heard about GDPR and you reflected on, oh, what does that mean? What will we have to do? Uh, those kind of situations when you're confronted to those, that's when you understand you need to be um, you need to be in control of your of your data. Um, and of course, and that is the link with uh, with the next subject that uh, Bernard will explain. APIs are uh, very important in uh, in the modernization of your uh, IT landscape. But when you say APIs, you obviously say data. Right? You need to be uh, uh, aware and in control and have uh, a clear agreements on how you want to handle your data, how you want to name things, etc. And so Bernard will dive deeper in uh, into uh, the API aspect uh, of things. Indeed, John. So APIs are uh, crucial in our strategy. And um, for those who remember uh, 2019, September 2019, there was a shock eh, in the financial uh, organizations because PSD2 uh, was then uh, launched or was then really uh, effectively active in 2019. So uh, it's the first time that yeah, banks had to open up their services, their data, to the external world. Uh, so we also, uh, within uh, 40s, we we took already then in 2018 also the, the decision together with the IT management to launch an, uh, an API at scale program. So we start, started then to, to really uh, set up an, uh, a governance around uh, APIs. As uh, John said, we have architectural committees and as from that point in time, we also said we need to include this API aspect within architectural uh, solutions. So from that point onwards, we uh, we started with this this API at scale. It was uh, a program that that really um, uh, involved all all the, um, the different roles within the organization and also the business. Huh? So API is something you think okay, it's technically it's something about. API uh, contract first. Uh, it it uh, it really puts an abstraction layer on top of the engine of the implementation of a certain uh, service. But it's also it's more and more becoming a product API as a product. So we have to have all the roles in the organization within this uh, journey. Uh, it helps in reusability. It helps in standardization. It helps in having a clear overview of all the existing APIs. And as from that point in time, we uh, inventorized all the internals, but also all the external APIs into this uh, repository, enabling us to build future proofed application with reusability as a key element uh, in there. So that's really important uh, step. The first step, I would say, in our landscape uh, change is to have APIs uh, and this will, as you will see on the next slide, enable us also to, to change the, the engine and, and uh, having uh, this as a first step is really important to, to change from monolith applications to more smaller applications. And that brings me to the next slide where we next to APIs, we also focus on our frameworks and our DevOps. It's clear that uh, these elements are key enablers in a faster uh, time to market. As I said in the beginning, this is also an expectation from our customer to be faster, to have more regular releases, deployments to production, 
new products, new in innovations that we can bring to the market. And so we, we really took there a decision to go for a microservice uh, approach where we build smaller applications that are in line with our organization, meaning we have squads that then can manage also those microservices in an end-to-end -end way with the concept you change it, you run it, you build it, you run it. So that's clearly in line with how we are organized within the bank and microservices uh, approach is fitting in that concept. Next to that, of course, we have to have enablers, frameworks. Uh, so we have a lot of different versions of frameworks over time. So we are standardizing these more and more in order to also uh, create uh, the, the ability that developers really can focus on what they have to build uh, and, and, and being less busy with integration issues and, and things about how to connect to each other. I said the APIs are helping a lot in there because they are the interface between the different uh, applications. And so squads can uh, develop themselves their own microservice and connect with each other via the APIs. And last but not least, we want to also have a deployment abstraction. So that we want to have uh, abstraction of where those microservices are really deployed and and the way they are managed from an uh, infrastructural point of view. So there we go for a uh, container based uh, solution. And so looking at all these elements, we have created an, uh, a development or a pipeline, let's say, covering a number of those aspects that you can see uh, in the different boxes from guidelines that we uh, share on, on guilds uh, around distributed development to uh, to take to other ones, automated testing. I'm really sure that this and convinced that this is really key in our uh, way that we, we need to deploy things to production is that automated testing is a key uh, element to have if you want to go faster to, to the market with a better quality uh, of our application landscape. And I also want to focus, uh, I'll give some, some elements around security, which is super, super important for us, of course, and not only for us, for other companies as well. But here we also have our security gating through this uh, deployment pipeline that are really important and where we can block applications in case they have contain vulnerabilities or security issues. We will block them during the, the different uh, deployment uh, phases. Voila, so this is really very important in our strategy. We have built up a number of those elements. And I propose, John, that you give us a, an example uh, of a result of, of uh, this, this story. Uh. Yes, of course, Bernard. And uh, uh, thank you, Peter, for answering the question. Eh? But indeed, uh, it's not only for Greenfield new applications that we do this, but we also address uh, our legacy. Uh, it's even an important priority of our strategic plan for uh, for the years to come. But then if you can go to the next slide, uh, Bernard, for the example. Uh, and um, trust me, it's a true story. Eh? It might sound like a Cinderella story, but but, but it's what truly happened. Eh? So uh, not so long ago, a few years back, our banking app uh, was rated uh, quite lower than, uh, than our direct competitors. And, and to be honest, indeed, the overall performance, the responsiveness, even the, the user experience, if I dare to say, was not was not on par with with what our competitors were doing. And at the time, two developers of our teams, on their own initiative, on their own free time, decided to redevelop our app in a completely standalone environment. And uh, they went and showed, they demoed that to our uh, head of retail business, <laughs> where um, the reaction was quite clear, but important. He said, ah, that's what I want compared to what we have. But the honest answer back then was, yeah, but we cannot have that for different reasons, because of the way we work, because of the tools we use, because of the rules we impose ourselves. We were not able to do just that. And that was an important trigger to try and understand how, why that was so and what we needed to change. And that's where a very small deal, I think, up to 10 people max was created of business people, of IT people to, to keep digging into what was created by those two developers and come up 
with uh, solutions to implement it at large throughout our organization. And I dare to say the agile transformation I was talking about earlier, this was kind of a, a, an embryo of what today has become the default setup of our complete organization where business and IT uh, are uh, together to reach uh, such results. And if we look at the scores today, obviously this modernization track on our banking app has, uh, has helped us improve quite a lot. And I, I, I'm confident to say that our customers are quite happy with the changes that, um, that we made on that. So that's a nice, uh, a nice example on where this can uh, lead to. And then on the final slide, uh, Bernard, uh, to conclude, um, yeah, it's it's it long term commitment on application modernization is uh, is 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 very important. Uh, I mean, if you get into situations where you need to ask your procurement department to negotiate an it's an extended support uh, contract with the supplier because you have an outdated version of something or you start to find it difficult to find resources to work on a, on a legacy application based on, a, on, a, on, on old technology, yeah, then you have probably missed a few steps in, in, in modernization uh, choices that you, that you should have uh, taken. And of course, like most of us, I would, uh, I would think you, you don't start from a, from a blank page. Eh? There is no, it's not only Greenfield situation, like the question that was raised, just before, and that's why you need to um, you need to involve your business uh, in those kind of decisions, and you need to be wary. On it's not about jumping on the latest hype train that comes along. If you remember a few years ago, blockchain was uh, very hot, still is to some extent. But it's not about as an organization being able to do all the latest things. Uh, if you decide to go that way, and, and, and it's up to you to make those decisions, you need to be able to commit and deploy them in an industrial way throughout your organization. Because if you cannot, you're just adding complexity to your landscape and you just have another variant way of doing something you were already doing in a lot of cases. And that's what you, that's what you really need to avoid. And obviously, with the example I just gave on our banking app, it's quite important. Uh, to remain relevant, <laughs> let alone be uh, competitive in uh, in what it is you do with uh, with your organization. Voilà. I don't know if we have no questions now. If we do that at the end, uh, up to you. Uh. I propose. I first of all thank you for this uh, story. It uh, illustrates very nicely. Why this, why this is important to look at for uh, quite a number of our businesses. Uh, propose to move then to uh, Frederick, uh, who will take us uh, in a story that will help us look under the hood of what it actually means. So, uh, Frederick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bart and Bernard and John for uh, this uh, introduction. So my name is uh, Frederik Piem. I'm with uh, X Plus as an enterprise architect. And today I'm going to uh, highlight um, a case which we are doing in partnership with Segeka um, to provide the technology foundations um, of these application modernization. Um, and we're doing that uh, for Eurocontrol. So first, let me give um, a short view on uh, Eurocontrol. Um, it's a, it's a, the central uh, intergovernmental organization which manages um, airspace definition, uh, flight and flow um, of the air traffic control and air traffic management. It is uh, sponsored and uh, it maintains the airspace of 42 member states. And yes, uh, to go into actu uh, the, the current uh, actuals, uh, Ukraine is also one of those member states. And that highlights uh, one of the functions of, Euro of Eurocontrol in terms of crisis management also. Yeah, for example, now um, eastbound um, Asian flights um, are rerouted um, because they cannot fly over the Ukrainian air airspace. Uh, which leads up to uh, to flight times uh, in addition to five hours extra. 
So this is what your control does. Now, the problem statements eh, they are confronted with is they have been building these systems um, for air traffic management and air uh, traffic control throughout uh, for a period of 20 to 25 years. And this is now reaching their limits in terms of scalability, and they are just up for application modernization. Um, another uh, very uh, essential element is that uh, Eurocontrol is a network organization. So it's a network of not only Eurocontrol, but all the um, um, aircraft uh, operators and ANSPs who are responsible of that air traffic management. Um, now, for this modernization, Eurocontrol has now launched uh, the INM program. Uh, it's an investment in this actual network management, um, and it includes a physical uh, part, which is a new ops center they're building in Brussels. Um, and of course, all of the applications uh, that uh, they want to modernize need to be fitted in there for that they have an investment. Um, it's not only an investment in the efficiency and the volume of these um, of these flights, um, but for the sustainability of it, they also want to reduce uh, the delays in the network um, and optimize the flight routes. And for that, they also need to um, modernize all of their processes, um, user experiences, because as said, they have systems uh, legacy of built up over 25 years. And above all, at the bottom line, it still remains mission critical um, and, and highly mission critical uh, architecture of systems. <laughs> In terms of timeline, and this is just, I'm not going to, into the details, but to illustrate uh, what they are uh, facing is uh, kicking off this uh, this program and transforming over the course of multiple years um, an investment in that, um, and it's a, a multi-year transition, uh, where the first, as you can see, the first operational uh, targets are in 2024. Now, in the rest of this presentation, uh, um, after setting this context, I'm going to uh, dive into what is depicted in this middle uh, line here, which is uh, the investment in a technology platform um, to serve this digital platform vision and this modernization um, program. Now, this this platform is is driven by um, certain goals, and I think uh, we recognize uh, the the goals. They are very similar to what we saw. Uh, with the case of um, BNP. Um, so technology-wise, uh, this needs to be a business agnostic enabler. It, it, is, it is to be suited uh, to a collaborative model where uh, the business services and the business applications are delivered by uh, aviation industry partners. Um, it must be an open platform because of that network organization and the, those partnerships and for that it will see what uh, what technology drivers are behind that it needs to be robust scalable and secure because of the mission critical highly mission critical uh, systems to accelerate and to modernize eh, we need to automate as much as possible eh, uh, make it uh, in an uh, agile way and invest into the DevOps um, and DevSecOps principles. And last but not least, uh, one of the principles is also to be able uh, to evolve this architecture um, and not to get stuck with monolithic um, legacy systems. It needs to be an evolvable platform architecture. Putting this technology platform at the center of it. What does it, what does it mean? It means that um, business services um, in the form of new digital products need to be able to be developed and deployed on the platform. They need to be exposed with an API um, um, layer. It is an uh, integration um, a driven and it's a highly data driven um, uh, model because of the nature of 
yeah, what Europe Control does. Yeah, it does not only yeah, do, do that operational management, but it is also a partner in that whole ecosystem um, to deliver data and data insights to their uh, to their partners. In terms of um, operations, the platform also has a central place because of uh, making sure that it is maintainable, um, it is oper operatable, and uh, all of the uh, operational insights can be uh, channeled through the interfaces of the platform. In terms of security, a uh, high focus is also on uh, applying modern uh, techniques, uh, especially also in terms of identity and access management. Um, on the bottom, we see legacy migration because, as we saw in the timeline, this is not one big bang approach. And also, as illustrated by our BNP colleagues, um, a legacy is there. You need to uh, take it into uh, the right steps and take. And the digital platform is also an enabler in uh, the migration of that. On the right side, you see also future and more innovative. Um, <laughs> Um, initiatives which um, on top of the data they have, Euro Control wants to also invest into techniques like machine learning and AI on top of the real time uh, management of the network, but also for the post operational and insights so that they can improve the network organization. Diving into um, more the details, um, and that's what we're going to do next, is give some highlights on okay, technology and technology integration, and what does it what does it mean? Um, so here's a mapping of some of the capabilities uh, of the platform. And without going into all of the details uh, and, and without enumerating all of the technologies, I'm going to highlight a few of these um, key uh, foundations. One is on uh, what I would call investment in infrastructure as code, uh, where technologies like Terraform and Ansible uh, are used to automate as much as possible at the core of this uh, platform. In the middle, we see eh, the, uh, and, and as mentioned previously, eh, the investment in a container, uh, containerized container management uh, architecture for the, uh, the build out of those digital products. On the top, we see a certain communication uh, channel uh, parts uh, with investment in API management and, and with API gateways, uh, but also in terms of uh, interoperability with um, the, the aircraft operators uh, for flight uh, management. There's also messaging with Solos as, um, as, a, as, a, as a channel to publish data to their partners. In terms of security, there's also a heavy investment, um, not only in the customer identity and access management and really using modern platforms uh, for that, but also in at the core, investing in secret management, uh, vulnerability scanning and so on. Also, and a key crucial part in the integration of this all is the um, the operations part uh, and the management of this platform in terms of certain sets of operation tools. Um, and that is also a key enabler uh, for a DevSecOps way of working. That will be uh, two more highlights I want to uh, deep dive on. One, so basically in DevSecOps, it's the augmented DevOps where security is also at the heart uh, and especially for these mission critical systems and security as at the, is at the top uh, priority level also for your control first if you if you look at the at the left uh, part if for the development part basically we have uh, investments uh, and this is also part of this modernization. It's not only modernization of the uh, of the platform, but it's also modernization of the software development lifecycle tool chain, um, which goes from required management um, with traceability towards the testing, 
uh, but also uh, leveraging cloud platforms like uh, the Atlassian tool suite, tool suite um, cloud infrastructure for development, uh, and as mentioned before, the, 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 the security tooling for code uh, quality checks, static uh, application security testing, software composition analysis, all built in at the core of these pipelines that deliver not only the platform itself, but also the products uh, as a common uh, tool chain. Going to the, to the platform itself, so on the left side, eh, we see artifact scanning as one of the capabilities, which is eh, the, uh, the part which integrates eh, the handover of uh, what is being built in terms of the products and in, in, uh, towards the deployment part. Uh, it also um, <clears throat> entails configuration and cloud configuration with the necessary policies. Um, and it involves the runtime protection of when it is in operations that it is also continuously monitored in terms of security. Security integration um, towards uh, ITSM seem um, is a is a key crucial part. Uh, the elements of auditing and logging need to be taken into account. Um, data security um, and so on. Now, this is all leveraged by this technology platform and digital platform vision, and this makes the modernization of these applications as uh, by nature checks in the boxes um, and that's uh, as we saw before eh, um, kind of um, centralizes all these aspects and makes sure that when uh, the products are developed they are by nature and by the fact that they are developed on this platform uh, secure and uh, compliant last i want to highlight not only the technology, but some challenges which come um, alongside. So basically, yeah. you need to take it uh, or support the whole transformation roadmap, yeah. and you need to take into account also the investment in, in such a platform. The platform itself is um, an enabler, so it hides all of the complexities yeah, and all of that integration, but it is a complex thing on its own and you need to manage it accordingly. A platform is not built overnight. It must evolve and it must, with early use cases and early uh, integrations, must become an adopted enabler for this whole program. Organizing, um, and I think here we did not go into agile uh, way of working, but Having such a platform is an enabler for it. Uh, you need to organize and um, have things like a platform team which uh, delivers and maintains this, uh, this vision. Finally, it is, as said, um, uh, geared towards the support for mission critical systems. And for that, uh, the platform also has uh, the necessary challenges and uh, compliance for um, um, necessary regulations, um, things like EASA, which is the, the regulator for uh, European airspace uh, safety. This concludes a brief overview of the case uh, we're doing for uh, for Eurocontrol. I don't know if we want to take uh, questions. I did not see uh, in this in the chat, but um... one question on a software composition platform. We have a look. What does the software composition platform allows you to do? Is the question. Uh, I do not quite catch the because the software composition platform, it's uh, the software composition analysis. So if that is the question, then this this is part of checks where um, uh, so you can do code analysis, you can do vulnerability scanning, you can also assess the dependencies of your software composition. But if that is the question. 
and that is built in into the pipelines in the in the secure software development lifecycle. Cyril, does that answer our question? If not, I propose that we move to. Uh, I first of all, thank you, Frederick. Thank you for uh, giving these uh, insights into what or I what what's an under the hood in such a platform. And I propose that we now move to Peter, who will take take us into a, a step back of all of this and look at the broader picture of this sort of evolutions. Peter, floor is yours. Am I coming through? Yep. OK, thank you, Bart. Um, so with regards to the content of this presentation, you start out with one thing in mind and then while you're busy, somehow it's like writing a book. The book becomes about something entirely different, but not not quite so. So what I would like to talk to you in this whole area around modern application foundation architectures is for me actually the big bonus that you have there or the, the big goal partly that you have to uh, also achieved through that is the case that I would like to make for continuous application lifecycle management. Um, <clears throat> so what we know is that some things never change, right? But only a very few companies can get away with that. Most of the times you're forced to change with the times. And uh, what we see in IT in information systems, we are today in the third large revolutionary wave in um, information systems. Oh, I'm going to get put my camera on. Sorry. Um, so we used to have the mainframe. We went to distributed, which is like completely changing the competences that you need. And then today we have with the move, move to the cloud, but also the, the, the idea of going to smaller granular uh, applications to microservices uh, the combination of these things um, is, is, is again another uh, uh, huge jump, uh, a threshold really in, in the whole history of information systems. Things like mini computers and uh, later the service oriented architecture, I consider them more like a, um, variations on a theme or minor evolutions compared to these three big ones. And so what you see is that over time we went through huge cohesion uh, environments that were hugely coherent to ones that have much more flexibility and, 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 and scalability. Um, so this relentless drive towards more granularity, more finer grain granularity, but also automation to increase the whole flexibility aspects uh, have all to do with, with shortening the time to market. Um, so this, 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 uh, as we have heard in for in the case of uh, BAP Paribas Fortis, is that this whole application landscape revolution is uh, accompanied each time with an organizational transformation. We went from a very hierarchical organizations uh, where there was just one boss to a matrix or, or matrix organization where you suddenly had two bosses to an or agile organizations where you don't have any bosses anymore at all, or, or at least that is the claim that is to be made. And each of these organizations prove that Conway's law <clears throat> still exists. An application landscape reflects the organization that it was built by, uh, uh, that applies. Um, you're going to see that in there. Now, the question is, however, who forces who to change? It's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Are you feeling that you need to change the organization because the technology changes and the organization needs to reflect the, the, uh, that in order to manage that technology well? Or do organizations change and by such they're going to look at technologies that um, uh, that support that organizational change. So it's a kind of a chicken and egg problem. Um, now, one of the things that is underappreciated is that there are a number of undercurrents that drive technology and te organizational uh, evolutions which companies shouldn't ignore. Uh, but, but they sort of do. I mean, if you look at evolving customer needs, competitor pressures, technology evolutions, and then the skills that people decide to invest in, and it's more specifically the expirable skills, which is the technology skills, because that changes. These um, drivers altogether are often difficult to disentangle. Uh, a company says we're going to do a digital transformation for these and these and these reasons, and that is all true, but it is relatively uh, narrow focused on just enabling those functionalities that they think they need and ignoring uh, um, the rest. So, so these driving forces in a way they are understood, 
mostly implicitly by and it and it externalizes itself by these more narrow uh, scopes in which companies change but they are not really structurally acknowledged and embedded in the investment cycle or the operating models of companies. Uh, they, 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 they're going to change and then they're going to change in that direction sort of, but never entirely because they never take that full idea about, OK, the, env the environment changes and we as a company needs to change as a whole, even though they say so. So what we see is that existing systems that uh, that are there are only changed when they are forced to do so largely. Now, what that means is that over time, and here I made a timeline from the 90s till now, uh, where we had these three elements, like the mainframe, the, the monolithical one, the packages, then the, the Java developments, the .NETs, and now you see more the microservice ones, which is obviously still in those languages partially. But what we see is that a lot of legacy applications uh, companies have are never rewritten in those newer technologies. After all, they work. So over time, you get a pile of different technologies that just increases uh, that are used in a company. And that in itself increases your embedded risks. Uh, for example, you have institutional knowledge that are tried. So especially if you have applications that are 20, 25 years old, there's only just a few people who, who know about that. There's uh, just a technology that's absolutely not supported anymore. Um, and so if something happens, then that, that represents the risks that is often under underappreciated. But also when then these large business transformation happen, then that legacy that is there is often not fit for purpose anymore. And you need to clean it up first. So before you can even start, you have to spend a huge amount of time uh, in order to clean that up, in order then to set the new uh, foundations and then to be able to provide business value that these uh, digital transformations would, 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 would bring you. Huh? Um, now, it is understandable why this happens, eh? because you write business rules, it's like pouring concrete, eh? it costs a lot and it takes time and to redo that, well, uh, um, uh, the cost of change is also expensive because it's embedded in the environment. And then it's very hard to argue the case for rebuilding the same functionality over and over again because technology changes. Uh, it's different. It's absolutely different than buying a truck, using it for five to seven years, writing it off and buying another truck. It's sort of the same physically, sort of, but it's very hard in the minds to say, why would I rewrite something that I already have? And that works for me today. Now, what we see is that the drive towards this smaller granularity in, in applications, these microservices, and then the flexibilities that the clouds offer you, that is a game changer in all that aspect because it enables ongoing application renewal rather than big bang choices where we're going to throw out big packages or a huge monolith application, rewrite huge monolith applications because we can uh, we, we cannot wait anymore. We are with our backs against the wall. Um, so that is definitely enabled by the industrialization of application development and the runtime deployment. Eh? The surrounding capabilities to automatically build, test and run microservices is much larger than for classical applications, but you have to have them. You have to invest in it to enable that continuous application lifecycle management. After all, Changing a microservice is much easier than changing a, a big monolith application, if only because it's smaller, you can do it with a single squad. And your interfaces, like John said, we have APIs, they are standardized, so it enables that automated testing. So it's much less disruptive to change these things than the big monolith applications. And so that investment in there has to be there. Um, and, and, and after a while, what you will see is, yes, you now suddenly have a, a lot more microservices than you used to have applications, but when technologies changes, you, you're able in a, in a kind of an ongoing run uh, mode rather than in a change mode, able to rewrite progressively and on a continuous basis these uh, microservices towards newer technologies that in the end uh, they all have to, uh, have to run on. And so it becomes much, much less traumatizing and much less budget and friendly to 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 do it so in, in in conclusions all the stories that you heard today are about radical modernizations uh, of the way that value is delivered to the business by investing in well we can say large cloud generally cloud-based IT platforms not exclusively but in general that's where the drivers are this 
modernization follows that multi decal uh, tens of years of evolution uh, of IT towards uh, from from big monoliths to finer granular applications and these supporting infrastructure. And the claim here is that the real price, for, I think, is to come to this situation where fol following the needs of the business becomes much easier through fluid and continuous uh, application modernization rather than these big bang uh, digital transformations that we see today. And that's basically the gist, uh, the, the main message that I wanted to give. Uh, we are explosive. We are here to help you. One of the most frightening words I'm uh, told sometimes by people. Thank you. If there are additional questions, don't hesitate to contact us. We're, we're happy to help you on this. And uh, many thanks for your uh, attendance and see you next time somewhere in two to three months. Thank you very much. Bye.